experts in the world. We have been downloaded in over 40 countries, actually exactly 40 countries. Italy, Greece, because we have Greece's greatest export with us, the Philly Godfather, six different continents. And if they put an internet station at Fort McMurdo in Antarctica, we'll hit all seven continents. We are killing it right now as far as downloads. And I want to introduce the people that are with me. Greece, the Greeks' favorite export, the Philly Godfather, the number one sports better in the world, Steve Maltepe. Steve, welcome back to our show. Man, thanks for having me back on, John. We're kicking can I say ass on the show? We're kicking ass. We <laughs> certainly can. <laughs> no, it's our show. I just want to make sure we can say I'm not even sure if we're R-rated PG. I'm not even sure. All I know is we're kicking so bad jazz and UFC, Joey's on fire. And speaking of ass, he is the host of PGA of America, the PGA Tour. He told me to say all this to how great he is. He's the best. He's a good-looking guy. I'm reading off my phone right here because you sent it to me. He is the coach. He is John McCoachman. Love you, coach. Thanks for being back on the show. We know that you don't, but I just got done watching the Godfather's video on live betting, and I, I, I just got to count how many I had last. One, two, three, four live winners on Colin Morikawa. Boom, boom, boom. <laughs> Copernicus was wrong. The universe revolves around coach. And also, they have been called the future of sports betting. Bobby and Matt, the college kids, are going to be on, especially later with us, going to be on the entire show, but they're going to bring us some NBA specials coming up. we got a ton of stuff going on, NBA with COVID. Guys, welcome to the show. Thanks for having us. All right, John. And Mr. The Joey Odessa. Joey O. He is four and one. I can count this because he won four. He lost one. That's four and one. I had a little problem with math last week. Joey corrected me. He, he sent me this abacus and I kind of figured this thing out. Four and one. He's the best combat sports handicapper in the world. Joey, listen, an another great night. What in the hell is going on with UFC? Dana White, there's no commission in Abu Dhabi. Judges were just as bad as they were in America. What happened? Wow. I mean, well, they're consistent, consistently bad. Uh, three of those fights, three of the fights that went to decision were, you know, the, the judges had different scorecards. I saw that one fight, Ezekiel Dos Santos, I mean, 30, 27 the other way. I, I just don't know. How could you possibly have filled that scorecard outright? That was just over the top. And you went 3-0 uh, and oh, and in the top three that were very ch uh, chalk heavy, the title fights. Uh, but Holloway, uh, we, we may have got a little lucky on, on that one, Joy. I certainly wasn't uh, mad about it but because uh, I wanted some money on it, but it looked like Holloway may not have won that fight. Uh, it was never in doubt. We had it from the get-go. Drop That's two rounds, sweep too. the next three. That's how we like them. You know, they're never easy, JBL. If it was easy, everybody would be doing it. And Bogotal did everything but hit somebody with a chair and throw fire in their face. He <laughs> need him, hit a ball, guy in the balls. I, there was not much that he didn't do. He was definitely a heel. I mean, he'd done good in WWE, right? I mean, he was mixing it up pretty good. Eye pokes, groin kicks. I mean, everything you can imagine. <laughs> I, I actually didn't mind losing that one because I just wanted to see Joey O go absolutely bonkers when one of his actually lost. And that's the only way that he loses these days is when somebody knees somebody in the head when their knee is on the ground, which is completely illegal. When so it's the only fight we lost, Coach. We all lost money. Everybody on this telecast lost money. Are you happy, happy Coach? We lost fight. on that fight. No, I want to see – yeah, and I'm not happy about it, but I still won money for the night. Sometimes it's about, the, it's about your reaction, Joey. I like Ooh. your reaction. <laughs> <laughs> Don't get hot. You, you want Joey to lo rough. lose so you can see his reaction? <laughs> I guess when you put it like that, uh, it doesn't sound as smart as what <laughs> it was in my head right there. So my apologies to the entire group. Uh, we love you, Coach. What is it, Steve? <laughs> coach rules? Coach rules, baby. Yes. If it was 90 days, you'd want to see somebody cheat on somebody for the reaction, right? So how it well, works? I mean, it, 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 does, it does work that way. It's all about the reaction. It's all about the drama. And we had a lot of drama on Saturday night. But this Saturday, Joey, we've got even more. What do you like this coming week? Because we're going to have a live Twitch show later on today. This drops on Wednesday. So all of us will be there. So we're going to talk about Wednesday's fights on Twitch. Let's talk about Saturday's fights. What do you like? Well, Saturday night, we got a rematch. Uh, Delson Figueredo against Joe Benavidez. If you watch that first fight, Joe had some success in round one. I thought that, that Figueredo won round one. I thought he was getting stronger. You know, he knocked him out in the second round. They butted heads a little bit, and then Figueredo just stretched him. I mean, Benavidez spoke after the fight. He looked deflated. I think, you know, he's come close a few times. But you know what? This rematch... 
you know, oh, Figueredo, the, excuse me, Figueredo didn't make weight for that fight either. Mm -hmm. So he wasn't eligible to win the title or he'd be defending the title right now. These guys are fighting for a title. I think Delson's going to just smash him again, whether it's in the second round, third round. He just bullied right through him. It was kind of like Jan. He just kept coming forward, coming forward, taking the best that Benavidez had. He almost subbed him in round one. But that's not even – like, there's some there's some decent fights on this card. Uh, you know, the, uh, this, the co-main event with Kevin Gastelum, not really in love with the fight. You know, both these guys coming off losses. Gastelum, you know, he had some success when he was at 170. He was bullying a lot of guys around. Now that he's at 185, you know, he just hasn't got it done. I think Israel Adesanya might have ruined him. This fight's about pick him right now. You know, it's something I might not want to go, you know, might not want to play, but on the undercard, and uh, the people that follow me will, will recognize this name, this Armin Tarkian. I, I don't even know how to say his name. Ar okay. Armak Tarkian. This kid can fight, and he can wrestle. He's a great amateur wrestler, junior world champ. Had a really tough opening bout with uh, Islam Makadaev, who's 18-1, kicking ass in the UFC. This kid came back, won his second fight. Now he's up against a Brazilian. I think he's going to beat this kid. He's about a two-to-one favorite. I don't like, you know, it's not a big accomplishment. He's supposed to when he's a favorite. I think he will win. It should be a little bit higher. Joy, we talked about on our Twitch uh, pregame show before uh, UFC 251 a lot about how to fix judges, how to fix what's wrong with the fight system. I mean, uh, you know, Dana White brings these guys over, and I'm not sure what they're looking – some of them were looking at. It looks like they're looking at a different fight. How do you fix the judging system in UFC? Well, I mean, a lot of people have talked about, they said open scoring. Open scoring doesn't do any good. Open scoring only helps a guy that might be getting jobbed who's down two rounds who now knows he needs a knockout, somebody like Ezekiel Dos Santos last Saturday. You know, I don't even think it's the 10-9 system. I just think it's the way that people interpret the action. People see different <coughs> things. I mean, I've sat at boxing matches. You know, I watched, uh, I remember Lou DeBow fighting Roy Jones at the Garden. The bow looked like he, you know, he was in that fight. But Jones was, you know, just beating him on the scorecards. Uh, it happens all the time. When you're ringside, you'll see these fights that are, you know, it, it just, I think your their perception at ringside is a lot different than on the TV. You know, maybe they're better served, you know, watching on monitors. But a lot of these guys, I mean, they're just, you know, they're just filling out cards. I mean, those scorecards last week with Dos Santos, I think they were a disgrace. Dos Santos knocked him down in the first round, and he ended up losing around 10-9. Yet on other cards, you know, they were given, you know, 10, eight rounds. I just don't think it's good. To, uh, to you state, get rid of the envelopes, John. You got to get rid of the envelopes. <laughs> the envelopes that are coming to the judges? <laughs> they get paid peanuts. <laughs> they get paid maybe, maybe $2,000 a show. I mean, I mean you, you, you can bribe the guy with a couple of milkshakes and two large pizzas. It's, it's sad. <laughs> yeah, there's no accountability for these guys, any of them. Well, when you're when you're looking at a fight, then you're looking at handicapping a fight. Then you obviously are looking at the judges too, right? Oh, sure. I, I knew who these judges were coming in. You know, KSW, Polish promotion judges, cage warriors. And a lot of times, the European judges they judge differently than the U.S. judges. I mean, it's all you know, it's all relative. In the end, all the good wins and the bad beats even out. You know, a lot of people think you know, like coach. Would have liked to seen Max got there just for the reaction, but you know, we see he saw a different fight than we did. We swept the last three rounds, we got it done, and we got paid. And you're a four and one, which I'm I'm good with that math. And if you add another card to it, I may have some problems with that. I may even break out the abacus. Abacus, she just can't even pronounce it. But Abacus. one good thing, one good thing about uh, at least the NFL is there's never suspect referees. Uh, there's never a bad <laughs> pass interference call or anything. So. The Super Bowl, go. every game changing call in the Super Bowl was against the 49ers. That wasn't an accident, coach. I mean, if you're actually in the stadium watching it, it didn't look anything like what it looked like at home. <laughs> but I guess I was the only one that was there. Anyway, Johnny, go ahead with what you were saying. My apologies. Once again, our entire conversation has gone to coach. <laughs> I'd like to get it about the division that, uh, I don't. I can't remember that team. It's from a Missouri or somewhere. They won something last year, but there's a there's another team there, the Denver Broncos. Uh, Steve, you got a future on us for the Denver Broncos. Tell us about that, please. Well, not only do I have a future, I love them the first game of the season. But like I said, there's a guy on this podcast right here. I'm not going to mention any names. He thinks I'm kind of nuts for being so bullish on the Denver Broncos. It could be JBL. It could be Odessa. It could be that guy who wears the Kansas City Chiefs hat on every week. I'm not going to mention any names. 
I'm not snitching on anybody. But he thinks I'm a little nuts. Anyways, I've been called worst. Uh, let's get to the let's get down to business here. Let's get to game 481, 482 on your uh, sports betting screen. Oddsmakers offshore opened uh, this game with the Denver Broncos being one and a half point favorites over the Tennessee Titans in Denver. The combined total was set at 42, which I think was a little light. I think you're going to see that total rise uh, as we get closer to the kickoff. Uh, obviously, there's been no movement in the market. No one's betting these games uh, when it comes to ticket count. When it comes to bet splits, uh, honestly, I think I might be the only guy betting NFL this early in the season uh, because, as you guys know, we love to move first. We love to get the best of the number. We love to get ahead of the market. I love the Broncos here. I buried – I laid one and a half. I laid two. I bet the money line. This Titans team didn't match up good against the Broncos last year. If you guys remember week six, the Broncos steamrolled uh, this Titans team. They beat them 16 to nothing. Uh, Tannehill did play in that game. Broncos defense held the Titans at 204 yards. They held Tannehill to 165 passing yards. They sacked them seven times, and uh, they held their uh, offense at just 3.3 yards per play. So this wasn't a good matchup against the Broncos last year, and this year it's even worse. Now you fast forward to this season. The Broncos had so many weapons on the offensive and defensive side of the ball, while Tennessee actually lost some key components uh, on the offensive line in Compton and on their defense with uh, uh, Jarrell Casey and uh, Logan Ryan. Uh, obviously, Conklin went to the Browns. In my opinion, he was a big reason why those holes were so big, even though Derrick Henry was steamrolling people, and he was like a bowling ball, especially late in the season and in the playoffs. Um, I think, uh, you know, Conklin was a big reason why that offensive line had so much success uh, running the ball. And then you got to add the fact that the Broncos, during the first two weeks of the season, are so dominant at home. Over, over like, the last 60 games, if you go back, this team is 51 and nine during the first two weeks of the season when they play at home. Okay. And it gets even more impressive. They're 21 and two since they built that new stadium. So obviously, that mile high altitude, uh, you know, players not being in tip top shape for the first two games of the season plays a big factor in Denver's home field advantage. So when you add the fact that they got such a home field advantage the first couple weeks of the season, then you add the fact that Denver got so much better. And let's be honest, I think. Uh, the Titans, you know, they're going to regress this season. They're not going to be as good. And if you just look at the market, if you look at the at the line, the odds makers are basically telling you that if this game was played on a neutral field, the game would be a pick 'em or Tennessee minus one. This is a team that got to the AFC Championship game last year, and now they're underdogs week one of the season against a team whose projected Vegas win total is only seven and a half. I ain't buying it. I think it's a fucking bet. I think the folks want you to take Tennessee here. I'm all over the Denver Broncos first week of the season, John. I love them. There is going to be some home field advantage. Uh, Coach gave me the tip, so I got to give him credit. Uh, about 14 to 18,000 fans are going to be allowed, at least right now. You know, things are changing rapidly with COVID and the, the pandemic that's going on. But right now, about 14 to 18,000 fans are going to be allowed into NFL stadiums. So there will be some home field advantage, not just altitude wise, but also fan wise. But, uh, Steve, you mentioned the fact. The Tennessee lost some good components uh, to their offense. They also lost the lottery for Tom Brady. At one time, it looked like Tom Brady might be going there. What do you see as far as the season totals for the Tennessee Titans? I'm, uh, I'm selling on the Titans this year. I'm expecting Tennessee to regress a little bit. Uh, I know a lot of so-called experts were really impressed from what they saw from this team last year, getting the AFC Championship game with Mike Vrabel. And this uh, franchise has somehow managed to win nine games in each of their last four seasons. So – I mean, why the hell is this season went total only eight and a half? I mean, think about it. It's a sucker's bet. In my opinion, they want you to go over this total. I mean, the books are begging for over money here. Now, listen, I know Tannehill, I mean, you can't lie. The guy looked pretty good last year. Uh, when he took over for Mariota, he threw for 22 and six. But the reality is their offense didn't ask much from him. He, uh, he was dead last in pass completions per game and attempts. And uh, he did, however, go seven and four straight up. He took his team to the playoffs. They beat the Patriots at home in Foxborough. Then they shocked the world. They beat the Ravens in Baltimore as 10-point underdogs. And if you guys remember, they jumped out to an early lead against Kansas City before losing that game. So with all that said, if you look just at, like I said, the price for the first game of the season, they're underdogs to a team with a season win total set at 7.5. It doesn't make any sense. Now, I think Vrabel's a real solid coach. I mean, we saw what he did to Belichick in the playoffs. He outcoached him for the first time. You don't see that very often. And if you look at the second-half adjustments that Mike Vrabel made last year, uh, 
This team was fourth in the NFL in scoring in the third quarter and fourth in the NFL in scoring in the fourth quarter. So that's huge. He was able to make those second-half adjustments that took this team so deep and into the playoffs. But in my opinion, this Titans team got really, really lucky last year. They played some bad defenses down the stretch to sneak into the playoffs before they did all that damage, and they definitely overachieved. I mean, it helps when you end up ninth in the NFL in the turnover differential. It also helps – uh, when you get really lucky in the red zone, they were number one in the red zone in scoring efficiency. Now, that's not going to happen again. The last team to rank number one two years in a row in the uh, red zone scoring efficiency were the San Diego Chargers, and that was back in 2004 and 2005. So a lot of things went their way for them to sneak into the playoffs. And listen, they played great, but I think they were a big overachieving team. And the other big question is, how uh, healthy is uh, Henry going to be? I know he had a monster year last year. He played in 15 games. He was steamrolling guys. But, I mean, he's been in the league since 2016. And 30% of his carries came uh, over, uh, over his career came just last year. So they kind of overused him a little bit. And that's a 40% increase over 2018. So how healthy is he going to be? I mean, how much damage did he take playing all those games last year? And today I read about his contract. They didn't agree on a long-term contract for Henry, so that might play some psycho, you know, psychological problems. Uh, he might be thinking, you know, this team doesn't want me. He might not be around next year. So that, that might also uh, you know, add to it. And then if you look at this team's uh, schedule, it's brutal. The first games of the season, the first six games of the season, they play uh, Denver away. They play Jacksonville. Then they play Minnesota. They play Pittsburgh. Um, they play uh, Buffalo, and then they finish the sixth game of the season against a division rival, Houston. Then they play Chicago and Cincinnati. Then they go up against the Colts. They go up against the Ravens, which is a revenge game for Baltimore and John Harbaugh. Then they play Colts in Indy, and then they finish up with a much better Cleveland Browns team. And then they end up uh, finishing the season with three of the last four games on the road. So the schedule's really tough. I mean, I, I can't see the team going over eight and a half wins, John. You know, one of the hard things in the wrestling business is when they put a really hot match on early because you got to follow that. So we're going to bring in a guy in that we're going to let's see if you can follow that. Coach, we are going to you next because you are the expert at golf. You're telling us that you are, how much you were live betting, how much you're winning, which is all true, by the way, because Coach Thank does you. know his stuff. But i got to ask you this. This is a huge tournament. Tiger Woods is 4-1 and one to finish in, in the top ten. Uh He's uh, I mean, four, four and one in the top ten, two and one in the top uh, four and one in the top five, two and one in the top ten. He's twenty to one underdog right now. This Shambo went from looking like a normal golfer to Thanos in about three months, <laughs> and Brooks Kupka went from Thanos to sticking an air in him, and he missed the cut last week. What do you got this week at the Memorial, Coach? Well, here's the thing. When I look at some of the, the odds that are coming out for this particular week, clearly Vegas is not watching a lot of these tournaments, which, by the way, the five tournaments that they've had since the pandemic have been as good of golf as you could ever have. Can you imagine last week having Justin Thomas to win, and then he drops the 50-footer, and then you got Colin Morikawa, 33-1, to 1, and he drops it on his head and then wins in a, in a playoff? And then We never like to promote betting on winners on Wednesday. It's a bad bet. And if you look at Bryson DeChambeau, he's plus 1,000. That means for a $100 bet, you only bring back 1,000. You got Rory, Justin Thomas, Tiger. Are you kidding me? It's a horrible bet if you bet on Bryson or really any of these guys at plus 1,100, plus 1,400. But here's where we like it. We like matchups, and we like top 20 bets. So I got my boy Las Vegas Wolf on the phone. And we had a little conference, and we actually agreed on several things. And – Three bets that I love that he actually loved as well. They're actually his, and I like them too. Uh, so, <laughs> this is a grown man's golf course. Bryson DeChambeau has been playing Army golf. Left, right, left, right. There has not been one lawnmower show up this week to cut any of the rough. It's going to be so high. Jack Nicklaus hated the fact that 19 under won the tournament last week. If you don't hit the fairway this week, you have no shot. Phil Mickelson, no shot. Rory Sabatini, minus 150 as of Tuesday to beat Phil Mickelson head up for the tournament. Sabatini, three top 25s in four starts since the pandemic. Brooks Kepka, he is going south. The only thing he's doing well right now is making fun of Bryson on social media. He was horrible last week playing in the first event on this same course. It's two weeks at the same course. We love Hideki Matsuyama, minus 140 to beat Brooks. We love Victor Hovland, who's been an absolute top 20 machine since the pandemic. 
all five events, top 25s for Hovland, three top 15s, and last week he finished third. We love him to beat Kepka. So those are three that we love. If you want a top 20 bet, a guy that I really like, Gary Woodland, plus 200 to finish the top 20. Last weekend, he shot 66, 69 on the weekend. And the only reason nobody was talking about him, guys, is the fact that it was really a three-horse race with Justin Thomas, Colin Morikawa, and also uh, Victor Hovland. But here's where I think it, it's, it's pretty interesting. If you really want to bet on a winner, how much has Colin Morikawa jumped up in the eyes of Vegas? He is a lower odds to win than Tiger Woods. And we know everybody loves to bet on Tiger Woods. So that tells you how much they're now in love with the fact that Colin Morikawa has more wins on the PGA Tour than he has missed cuts in his career. That stat is incredible. And that shows what kind of a star he's going to be. So if you like this week, the stars are out. All the stars are there. It's going to be a great week to live bet, match up bet during the week. So pay attention to our daily videos and our stats. Uh, but it's going to be a fun week on the PGA Tour. By the way, Coach, you, go, go ahead. ahead, Coach. Uh, Coach you're, talking about, you're, talking about, you're talking about stars, uh, Coach, are none, yep. none bigger than Tiger Woods. At one point, yep. he was increasing ratings about 50% in tournaments that he played in. He's back. When he had the game, when he had uh, Peyton Manning as his partner against uh, Tom Brady and Phil Mickelson, he plays out there five hours, pouring rain, a lot of fooling around, a lot of stuff going on. He didn't miss a shot in five hours. He hit every shot he yep. had to hit for five straight hours. How do you see Tiger Woods this week? Obviously, people, Tiger Woods is going to be a betting favorite this week. A lot of people are going to want to bet on him to win, but he certainly creates a lot of interest. Are you betting anything on Tiger Woods this week? Well, I'm going to bet on the individual days on Tiger Woods because right now the, the tournament bets, he's actually an underdog. So usually they'll match you up with who you're playing the first couple of rounds with, and he's playing with Rory and Brooks. And so if you got Rory, he's obviously going to be a betting favorite over Tiger Woods. Now, if people are really paying attention and you paid attention to his um, press conference he had on Tuesday, he said, I could have played the last five weeks. He wanted to see how the tour was going about with the COVID testing. He said – Every time I play golf, every time in my entire career, I have people touching me. I have people near me. The crowds are 12 deep. I can't just go out there and play like everybody else. So he wanted to see how everybody else was affected and then come back at this particular tournament. He says, I'm healthy. For the first time in a really, really long time, he's been able to work out. He said, my game is on point. So I think there's going to be a lot of value in Tiger Woods, especially on Thursday. He's a notoriously slow starter. He's usually four or five back after day one. You might really get a good price on Tiger heading into the second round on Friday when he gets his feet underneath him and then starts to move. Thank you, Coach. And now you want to return the favor and introduce me for the, the stock picking segment and say well, something yeah, really I, nice I, about I, me? Well, I mean, I had a really good thing, but I thought you could do it to yourself. But since I'm going to do it, last week, in fact, the last two weeks, every single stock that you've talked about has gone the direction that you have said it was going to go. In fact, DraftKings continues to drop, just like you said it was a little bit overvalued. I actually Googled something yesterday, and I thought, where is Google at right now in the whole scheme of stocks? Can you tell me? I certainly can, Coach. Thank you for a, what a wonderful introduction, Coach. Uh, <laughs> look, they have been, been right on the stocks right now. You know, don't fight the Fed is the main thing. A lot of stocks are going up. I, I've always thought that DraftKings is by far the best – a sports betting mobile company out there. I think it's a little overvalued. If it, said it, if it got below 35, it could go down to as low as 25. I think there's still a chance of that. But Google, to me, it's about follow the money. And, and to follow the money, you, you got to know where money wants to go. And money right now wants to go to India. So India, you give a little bit of uh, background on India. India, 2015, had 259 million internet users. This year, they have 600 million. Uh, internet users. That's a double uh, in just about five years. So people look at that and they mistakenly say that is a huge middle class growing in India. The middle class is growing, but not doubling in five years. What happened was is Ambani, who's the richest person in India, is a 27 story house right there in the center, center of Mumbai, right next to one of the biggest slums in the world. So it's a, it's a bit of a problem for him as far as uh, public perception. But he's done incredible things with Geo, J-I-O. He's taken internet and he's basically given it to the masses. So you go out there and you see in slums, which I was in a lot of the slums in Mumbai and New Delhi working with a lot of kids in sports programs, you see internet everywhere because internet is almost free. So when you look at people that don't have much, they don't have televisions, they don't have a lot of things, 85% of India is 4G internet only six percent 
of uh, internet is Wi-Fi. So you have all these people who don't have televisions watching just tons and tons of video. So sporting groups and tour groups thought, let's go to India because we have so much internet usage of what we're doing off YouTube and people aren't selling tickets. They're not selling tickets because India is not getting richer. Just more people are watching the internet. So, uh, and when you have companies that are trying to get into that, you had say Walmart and Amazon, Prime Minister Modi is very nationalistic. It's very much India first. And he ruled against, he changed the law against Amazon and Walmart. He said, you've got to own everything you sell. There can't be third party sellers. What it did was it hurt Amazon and Facebook. So Amazon and Walmart, who just bought Flipkart. Facebook steps in to Ambani and says, we want to get into mobile payments. And as I mentioned this before, I first mentioned Facebook around $185. It's now about 240 and the reason, big reason is they got with Ambani and they said, we're going to put $5.7 billion into your company, which is highly levered. The Saudis were supposed to put $10 billion in this company, but because of the oil uh, price war they had with Russia, they don't have the money. And so Ambani was in trouble. Now you have Intel, you have Qualcomm, you have KKR, you have Vesta, you have all this private equity. And you have Facebook giving them $5.7 billion. The reason is they want to take their 225 million WhatsApp users and use them for private banking. Google just did the same thing. This is payola. Payola at a very high level. Google is giving $4 billion to Ambani to get mobile payments and financial transactions to all of their users. You're creating the biggest banks in the history of the world with Facebook, with what Amazon is gonna to go to and with Google. But you look at what Google is. Google has $119 billion in cash. They, they spin off every year $54 billion in cash. You ask, what are they doing with that? They're buying the world. They've got four undersea cables right now. They have one that goes between North America and South America. They have one that goes between Virginia Beach and the French Atlantic Coast. They have one that goes between South America and uh, Africa, and they have one that goes between the California and Hong Kong. These are 250 terabytes. To give you an example of what that is, that means you can download the entire Library of Congress three times every second, 24 hours a day. This is unbelievable. They are, they are going to own the internet infrastructure with all of this money. That's why when I say three of the top five stocks of hedge funds are Google, Facebook, and Amazon. Just buy them. You know, you're going to be okay. Now, Google is a trillion dollar market cap company. Is it going to go up four times and be four trillion? No, it could eventually over time. But is it always going to be a, a growth machine like GE used to be back in the day when, when Jack Welch ran it? Absolutely. Google, with that cash, they're getting fined a lot of money. They got a $9 billion fine last year, $9.3 billion. They wrote a check for it. That's This is not <laughs> a big deal to these guys. Right. So, and Google, when you talk about America, is losing the artificial intelligence battle with China. That is true on the government level, not on the company level. Google employs, according to some reports, 50 of the top 100 AI scientists in the world with that cash. They are doing things that are beyond belief. Waymo, the self-driving car, somewhere between where 75 and $125 billion. So Google has an idea. And yes, is this a monopoly? You better believe it's a freaking monopoly. But it makes prices cheaper. Unlike when Rockefeller did it back around 1900 in Standard Oil, you had the ability to price people out of the market. This is making prices cheaper. So no government is going to fight these guys. They're going to fine them a little bit. They're going to get a little money here and there. They're not even bringing these guys hardly before Congress. You see Zuckerberg, you see Bezos, all these guys going before Congress. You don't see the CEO of Google. You'll see him show up, but he's never going to be the highlight. They have found a way to simply try to take over the entire world internet. And that's exactly what they're doing. And that's why I'm just tired of fighting it. A few years ago, I bought Google, Facebook, and Amazon. And I think there's still a good buys here. And for all of you out there sitting at home right now, this is the only place on Follow the Money where you can have all of that information and actually understand and not have some idiot on <laughs> one of those financial channels given to you. Johnny, thank you so much for that. We're very excited this week to have, for the very first time on the podcast, the college kids, Bobby, Bobby and Matt. And we're going to wrap things up because the NBA just got to the bubble. Uh, they're all working out. They're all there. Guys, I know you've been firing on 
a couple of totals because things are a little bit weird. If you can explain how they're going to do things uh, in the NBA bubble down there in Orlando and what you guys like and how you're beating a couple of the numbers. So essentially you're going to have an eight game regular season and there's 22 teams returning and basically they're going to be fighting for seeding. The eighth seed, if they're within four games of the nine seed, then they're going to have a play in tournament and basically it's going to be a best of two series and basically, if the ninth seed wins the two games, had to add matchups, they're going to get in. Wow. Wow. So, I know you're looking at some games that are coming right out of the shoot. And it's yep. going to be interesting, guys, to see uh, who's going to be in shape, who's, who's going to be playing, because we know, like, Russell Westbrook has COVID. What games are you looking at that you like, that you think the number is just a little bit off? A game that we love here is going to be Portland Moneyline, minus 120. Uh, Carmelo Anthony is in the best shape of his life, maybe. He's the slimmest he's ever been. And they're saying he's the best shape he's ever been. So we like uh, Portland here. Dame has been on a tear all year. He's been a scoring machine. And they finally helped him, okay? They've been missing Nurkic, and they've been missing Zach Collins. They're two big men. And Nurkic was really good for him last year. He was averaging 16 and 10. He had them at fifth in total rebound percentage last year. Whereas this year, they haven't had those guys all year, and they're 23rd. So there's a big drop-off, and now they're finally getting those guys back. They're going to come in healthy. And I think the line's just way off here. I mean, we have Nurkic coming in. It's going to stop uh, John Morant from penetrating the lane. He loves to run fast pace. He loves to drive and kick out to his young guys. And we just think he's going to slow the game down. So we also like the under here, under 222 and a half. We, both, we think both plays are good here. I mean, John Morant's been awesome all year. I think he's going to win Rookie of the Year. We give that out earlier in the year, plus 450. He's on track to do it. We've all taken notice of him. He's a great talent. And we got him on our watch, but I think he's going to find out finally what it's like to be on Dame time. What what extra metrics are you guys looking at when you handicap a game? I mean, there's no home court is no longer very important. And you have obviously have this problem with you that you can't – uh, figure out who, who could get COVID next. But when you're looking at, are you looking at stats that are starting from the first half of the basketball season? Are you looking at who is by reports is in shape coming back? What are you looking at that are extra metrics for the start of the season? The more information, the better. I mean, you're going to go and you're going to be looking at pace stats from when they last left off. Then you're looking at certain teams, like you're changing their lineups. You look at the Sixers, you're going to have Shake Milton running point guard and Ben Stammons running the power forward now. Now, he might be a point forward a little bit, but Ben Simmons, you know, he loves to push the pace. So, you know, they're going to take a slight regression. That's why we actually gave that the under in the Sixers. Under 211 actually went down to 209 and a half now. So, you want to find a information that, like, isn't very well known or isn't being, you think, factored correctly into the market. Well, I mean, let me ask you this, because obviously me and JBL work together like a hand and a glove. It's a beautiful <laughs> symbiosis. You guys are a combination, and I follow you. I pay for your information, full disclosure. I fire, fire, fire. How do you guys work together to get uh, the picks that you send out? Um, we sort of really do our own research and end up just bouncing ideas off each other, what we find, um, what we find key in certain situations. Um, I look at a lot of first-half bets, um, first-quarter bets, just kind of look at the stats that way. Matt will look more towards, like, totals, full game, and spread. And we sort of just bounce ideas off of each other and just sort of jot that down and add it into like a massive amount of stats that we just pile in to make a decision. Uh, we can't wait for the next couple of weeks as uh, the NBA really gets, uh, really gets going. If you're listening to this podcast on a Wednesday, the college kids will be with us live on Twitch later today for our UFC pregame show. Godfather, we got to get out of here. What are you looking forward to this week? Um, just winning, Coach. I know you're on fire. Joey's on fire. I think Bobby had a total in the NBA, a season win total, to finish the uh, the podcast up. If you want to go back to Bobby real quick, I think he'll spit it out for you guys. Give it to me, Bobby. Uh, so the total that we really liked was the Magic over two and a half. We saw that line move up to three and a, three and a half at some books. Um, you have to look at it. There's eight games remaining. Orlando's the number eight seed, and they're a half game out from the seventh seed behind who else but the Brooklyn Nets, who have aren't going to have Kyrie, DeAndre Jordan, then mm -hmm. we KD. Now Beasley's out. Wilson Chandler. I mean, you look at their whole team. Their whole seven to eight guys are out. Um, they're 2-0 and already against the Nets this year. It's tough to get a full season sweep. But we see two wins without a doubt against the Nets. Uh, or against the Nets. That should be two easy victories. They play the Kings, who they were 1-0 and against this year. Um, 
before the shutdown, the Magic were top five in offensive efficiency in their last three games and top 10 in defensive efficiency on the year. So we really like Magic over two and a half wins to finish out the season. You know, it's a crazy world when you're betting a season total of over two and a half. <laughs> <laughs> you know, something's gone crazy. All right, so I'm you're going to show once. And you cut off Bobby, so now you can try. <laughs> Go ahead and wrap it up again, Coach. Well, wait a second. I'm a little, I'm a little, I got a little tear. I feel so proud. I mean, the kids are doing so good, and it makes me feel good. You know what I mean? As a father, we taught them well. They're doing great. And I actually, I mean, full disclosure is I follow them more than I follow you, Godfather. I mean, I'm, I'm, just, I'm just saying. I'm just saying. Joey, uh, Joey, what is wrong with this man? What is wrong with this man? <laughs> I guess I guess coach like losing thirty five uh, uh, percent of his uh, football. What do you got? Thirty five percent last year in the NFL. I was sixty four point eight percent in the NFL, and you're now following coach. What's going no, on? No, the only thing that I'm angry at is I didn't start following till December. <laughs> but this year I won't make that mistake. I'm going to be there from the jump. Speaking of from the jump, Joey O, are you going to be able to make time for us later today? Or do you sure. have to get your, your, your makeup ready for uh, all the fights tonight? Are you going to be there? I'll be ready. I'm you want to insult anybody else, Coach? I mean, you want to insult the Philly Godfather, the legend himself? He's Joey taking Hill. shots at everybody. He's taking shots no, at everybody. No, I, you want to insult Maki M, our, our producer? Anybody <laughs> else you want to insult, Coach, and put yourself on? No, I'm just I, – I am, I am happy you decided to shave this week for the show, but I don't want to insult anybody else. I don't want to insult anybody else. Uh, Johnny, what do you like this week? What are you looking forward to? I'm going to fire, Coach. I love all these guys. See, I love the Philly Godfather. I've followed him for years because I'm not I'm not like a bandwagon hopper, okay? I didn't hop on the freaking Chicago Bulls in 1996, pal. <laughs> <laughs> so I got Seabiscuit. I got Man of War. I got I, – you are Mr. Ed, by the way. I've got – the best sports gamblers in the world. And what I'm going to do, I'm going to be like Wyatt Freak freaking Irk at o OK Corral. I'm going to fire, Coach. I'm going to fire all week. All right. Quick reminder, live Twitch show later today on – or later if you're listening on Wednesday. On Saturday, we'll have a live Twitch show before UFC Fight Night as well. For the college kids, I uh, love you guys. You're going to be back many, many times. For the Godfather, for Joey O, for JBL. I'm the coach. Don't forget F at FT money underscore pod on Twitter, Instagram, download, subscribe on Apple, Google, Spotify. There's only one place to get all the winners, beat all the numbers. And at the end of the day, you know what to do. Follow the money.